Uh, welcome, this is Terry Fox. We're into section four, how vias behave as a function of frequency. This is all part of the uh, making serialized, deserialized circuits uh, work better. You can get more information on my website, but in the meantime, off we go. Now, making circuits work, and it, basically we, we have to look at how vias behave as a function of frequency. Now, my main tool for doing this is the signal via bypass wizard and the power integrity part of Mentor's hyperlinks. Uh, we can look at it on a pre-layout basis by using Mentor hyperlinks line sim. I can look at it a post-layout basis using Mentor hyperlinks board sim. There is also an advanced via a capability that I'm not going to uh, talk about in this video, uh, but you can talk to Mentor about that. Now, when I look at the pre-layout uh, situation, Hyperlink's line sim, it'll use the real stack up because I'm using whatever is the stack up that I've assigned to this. It will use a reflective board outline. In other words, it's using whatever size board. If you told the tool that I've got a four inch by six inch board, then it assumes that at that boundary it is reflectable. It is reflective. Now, this will only account for elements that are entered into the simulation. On the other hand, if I go to the post layout tool, Hyperlink's board sim, it does the same simulation, but everything is real. It takes longer to simulate because there's more involved in it, but it is a much more, uh, well, it is, it is real. It's not theoretically theoretical, it is real. Now, let's uh, start looking at some elements that, that affect via performance. Uh, a via is a via a re is a via really a via or is it a filter? A good via behaves as a simple transmission line with linear attenuation and linear phase shift versus frequency. A bad via behaves like a filter with radical response changes in attenuation and phase shift versus frequency. So in other words, a good via looks like just a plain old non-frequency sensitive uh, connection where a bad via has a frequency sensitivity to it and the question is where is that frequency sensitivity and how big it how big is it now an acceptable via has no bad behavior in the information passband so for example if I was looking for PCI Express uh, 3 which is an 8 gigabit per second the center of energy is about 4 gigahertz now if there are no resonances below 6 gigahertz the via is a wonderful via. It's doing exactly what you want it to do. If there are no significant resonances before, below, say, 4.5 gigahertz, it's probably okay. If there are significant resonances at 4 gigahertz and below, the via will be a problem unless you have very short traces and a great amount of design margin. Okay, so what affects this, this via performance? There are two primary things. First of all is the return current path. You need to have a clearly defined return current path that you know is adequate for the frequencies involved. So in other words, if I have got a ground stitching via that ties the ground on layer 3 to the ground on layer uh, say 13 for a 14 layer board, or ground on layer 2 to ground on layer 13 for a 14 layer board, if I've got a, a stitching via that ties those grounds together and it is right beside the signal via that works much better than if that ground to ground connection is two inches away. If it's right beside it within say 25 mils or something like that that will probably perform quite nicely. On the other hand if it's two inches away you'll probably have big resonances uh, you know, well below four gigahertz, and probably down in the in the uh, low hundreds of megahertz at that sort of distance. Now, an inadequate return current path can result in information band resonances, which are bad. Now, I'll explain what bad means a little bit later, but just remember, you need to have a good return current path in general. If I take the most simple situation, that would be a signal that changes 
uh, layer and the reference player reference plane for the starting layer is ground the reference player layer for the finishing plane is ground and I've got close ground to ground stitching vias surrounding the signal via that is my best situation and it's my most clear-cut situation there are other situations that's the reason we're going to do a lot of this video uh, simply using the uh, uh, the mentor uh, simulation tools now a second problem we can run into are via stubs assume a 14 layer board if I take a via from layer 1 to layer 14 or in other words from the top of the board to the bottom of the board there is no stub the signal is running through the entire barrel of the via if I take a via from the top layer to layer 3 it has a stub that goes from layer 3 to the bottom of the board. Now that stub, depending upon the frequency, it may look like a capacitor, an inductor, resonant circuit. Uh, if it is resonant, uh, if, it, if the resonance is in the information band, this is bad. So let's look at some examples and we'll get into the uh, mentor uh, hyperlinks tool and particularly the uh, power integrity simulator. Okay, we're going to begin looking at uh, how a real via behaves. The tool that we're using for this is Mentor Hyperlinks Line Sim. I'm using version 9.4 right now. The lab that we're doing is the PCI Express 3 Simple L2 uh, Cutoff FFS. Um, we'll use this in a number of different uh, labs. The two sections that I'm looking at this section I'll uh, zoom in a bit so you can get a better look at it um, let's get at this thing okay well small window and lots of information well, we'll do it this way. Okay, this top portion, this happens to be the uh, what we call the, the signal integrity portion of it. So if I was doing interactive simulations, etc., I would be using this top window, and what I've got are drivers, transmission lines, uh, terminating type resistors, vias, etc., but the assumptions are perfect planes, perfect power, and all planes connected together through zero impedance connections. That's the assumption if you are simply using the signal integrity part of the tool. Now, on the other hand, if I look at the power delivery part of the tool, this tool says that I've got a board outline, and if you look right down here, that board outline is... Uh, about eight inches wide and about six inches high and in the board outline I can take a look at the stack up and here's my stack up so I've got a 14 layer stack up uh, ground plane here and a ground plane there and that's all that's important for this particular situation so 14 layer stack up and I've got some elements on this I've got U4 and U3 and if you go back and look at uh, this, U1, U2, oh, I see, they, they, renum they renumbered them because they, they didn't want to have a duplicate. So let's go back to this, to there. Okay, so I've got two active devices that I'm defining that can be pulling uh, power out of the board or putting power into the board. Uh, I've got one, two, three vias here. I've got uh, C1 that is a capacitor just sitting up in the upper left hand corner. And if I view uh, highlight net and uh, highlight that, you'll notice that I happen to have in this particular case, I've got layer two cut back. So this is layer two and I've cut that back and that's part of a different uh, demonstration. 
So, now getting back to the point at hand. What I want to look at is I want to look at the behavior of a signal going through these various vias. So I've got V3, V2, and V1. So let's go through and we'll look at the power integrity signal via bypassing. So the first thing I'll look at is is via 1 and via 1 okay via 1 it goes from the top to the bottom these are the capacitors that are on the board I've only got one capacitor on the board at the moment uh, target oh, I'll put this one so that makes it uh, one ohm you can put in whatever you want this is just simply a line on the screen uh, I'll do custom uh, that's fine and I'm going to go up to 10 gigahertz here so up to 10 gigahertz and off we go so I'm going to run this and since it's uh, got a good deal of calculation to do I'm going to pause this for a moment uh, until we get up to 10 gigahertz okay we're rolling up on 10 gigahertz as far as the simulation is concerned when we get there we will see what is the performance of that via uh, basically we're looking at the attenuation as we go through the via and we're looking at the phase change of the signal as we go through the via. So here we go. I guess I've got to open this up so we can see it. And let me correct a couple of things here. I'm not quite sure why that is doing that, but here what you see now I'm in magnitude and this is frequency so this is 1 kilohertz that's 10 gigahertz as I go up in frequency so for example below 100 megahertz it really doesn't make a lot of difference even if this if you look around V1 there are no uh, nothing that ties the ground planes together until you get to there or you get to there or you get over here to one of these locations so up to that first frequency as long as uh, I'm well within a quarter wavelength uh, then even if the if the connection between the ground planes are further away it's no big problem now you'll notice that as I get up here to uh, roughly four gigahertz uh, there is a lot of of change of amplitude with respect to frequency and in fact at 4 gigahertz I've got about 76 ohms or so of uh, actual attenuation and below 4 gigahertz I've got frequencies where I've got 115 ohms of actual attenuation now that is a problem because what we're saying is that I have a frequency response in the band pass and that is going to interfere with the information uh, coming out uh, you know the other side of the via now if I was to take one more look at this let's take a look at angle and now what you see is I've got changes in phase that are running from 90 degrees uh, one way all the way back to zero degrees so I've got many many things that are giving me 90 degree uh, type phase hits or pretty close to 90 degree type phase hits so when that happens think about what that does to the uh, to the phase lock loop in the uh, in the receiver in other words that stuff looks like jitter or I could call it inner symbol interference many different terms now I'm going to minimize this and I'm going to use a different via and in this one yep, I've got something I want to close that alright so if I look at this via you'll notice that there are no no stitching vias that are close around it now I'm going to go to V3 
And if you take a look at V3, you'll notice that V3 is the signal via, and then around it are these stitching vias that tie L2 down to L3, and these are ground-to-ground uh, -ground connection points. Now if I go back and I simulate this again, but this time instead of taking V1, I'm going to take V3. Is that correct? Yeah, V3. Then I'll simply run that one and we'll see how that works. And in this case I haven't paused it because I've the simulation is running much faster. Now, this was with the uh, V1, which had no close stitching vias. This one is with V3, which had four ground-to-ground -ground stitching vias spaced about 100 uh, mils uh, center to center from that uh, via. This has got a lot of jagged lines in it. Now realize that since I'm dealing with uh, a log-log scale here, this point, uh, this, this, well, let's go out to 4 gigs. If I go out to 4 gigs on the green line, he says that he looks like about, uh, about 16 ohms at 4 gigahertz. And up here at 4 gigahertz, on the red line, it says it looks like about 77 ohms. You notice that this is smooth below the 4 gigahertz line. If we look at angle, these are the phase hits, if you will, in angle as a function of frequency. And the green line, that was what via 3 looked like. So depending upon how you do this, we can have rather radically uh, different behavior out of these vias just depending upon whether or not you pay attention to the return current path. Now, let's go and I'm going to uh, close this. I'm going to go back and look at the... Now, we were dealing with V1 and V3. Now if I take this transmission line and instead of being on the bottom, if I take this and I bring it up to like signal layer 4. Signal layer 4 says that now I've got a via that goes from the top to signal layer 4 and as a result I am going to have So I'm going from layer 1 to layer 4. That means that from here down, I've got a stub on that signal. Now you remember that V3 was the one that had all the stitching vias around it. So let's go through and let's look at the performance of V3 when I come up to layer 2. And then what I'm seeing is just the effect of the stub below it. So I'm going to go back to the Power Delivery Network Editor. Uh, and now what we'll do is we'll go and we'll run V3 again and see what happens with that stub. Now if you'll notice the simulation is running a little bit slower and that's because I've got that stub that's going from layer 4 down to layer 14. So since it's running a little slower I'm going to pause this uh, until we get uh, through with the simulation. Okay we're rolling up on the uh, top of this uh, simulation and again what we're looking at is the effect of the stub so there we go now the green line this was when via 3 went from the top of the board to the bottom of the board this line is when v3 went from the top of the board to layer 3 and I would have a, uh, a stub that is going from I mean from uh, uh, top of the board to layer 4 and I've got a stub from layer 4 down to layer 14. So are things like back drilling important? Yes they are. Um, so I guess the point of all of this is that how you 
how you implement your vias is critically important and you've only got two choices in the approach. One is you can go through uh, use something like line sim or physically do some test boards and figure out how close do I have to have stitching vias in order to preclude any possibility of a problem uh, within my information band or your other choice is to basically roll the dice and see whether or not it works out. So my recommendation is use vias where you know how they perform, where you can prove that they are adequate, and then uh, go on from there. All right. Now, there's one other thing that I ought to show you and that is the problem the problem of having vias that are too close to the edge of the board now if I zoom in on this you'll see that I've got a via and right now it is right on the edge of where the ground plane is cut back so it's right on this edge and if I was to go through and uh, simulate that, you'll find out that I would have a lot of problems because the field, uh, you have to have this, this via back far enough and so it's solidly over both the ground, you know, the ground plane and you don't have half the field lines that are off the ground plane. Uh, for sake of the length of this simulation and this uh, uh, video, I'm going to have to cut that short. Again, anybody that is looking at the video and uh, you're looking at this in the context of uh, the training class, uh, please just uh, uh, give me a call or uh, send me an email and we'll, we'll set up a web meeting and uh, explain things when you, uh, when you have questions about it. So thank you very much. This okay, this is the end of Section 4, how vias behave as a function of frequency. Again, uh, if you're taking this as part of the uh, uh, my training class, uh, if you have questions about this, uh, please uh, give me a call or uh, send me email and we'll get that straightened out. Thank you.